Hello, I'm Steve Bell, Chairman and CEO of Tennessee Bank & Trust. We are a privately owned bank with offices in Cool Springs and Green Hills focused on customers that would like traditional, personalized banking with high-tech services. Our staff of experienced bankers have been empowered to take care of their customers. We are a business that happens to be a bank, and our customers tell us the difference is clear. I'm going to jump right in. We've got some great experts, and um, we're going to talk today about branding, and we're going to talk about how to engage your employees to be part of the branding, to be brand ambassadors. A lot of companies I know um, just forget about that internal force they have and how effective it is, how cost efficient it is. But branding means a lot of things to a lot of people. And I thought we'd start with you, John Lowry, since you're a professor over at Lipscomb. And in your opinion, what is a brand? Well, simply stated, I think your brand is how the marketplace defines you. And there are a couple of things that go into that. One of them is perception, what you see in terms of a lot of the marketing and communications. Another thing that goes into that is the experience that people have when they come and engage your business. And as we think about engaging employees in that process, that's where it's critically important that they understand and are tied into the overall brand or whatever the enterprise is because the experience that people have is going to be significant in terms of how they feel about you and more importantly as we found at Lipscomb how they feel about themselves. Uh, so much of branding is, is not what people think about you but what they think about themselves when they're going to you, your uni university or uh, they're engaging your company for products or services or something like that. So I think branding has uh, a lot to do in terms of uh, providing a experience for people that is positive and that requires everyone on the team to contribute to that. Great. And, and we know it's not a logo, a slogan. You know, those of us in advertising and PR would love to think, oh, it's the slogan, it's the tagline, it's the jingle, but it's not. It's everything around that. And um, Bill, well, I, can I, can mm -hmm. I piggyback that? Branding is nothing more than a promise. Uh, but it's not the cause, it's the effect. The cause are the, these people that we're talking about. Uh, we're not in the hamburger business, we're not in the legal business, we're, we're in the people business. Everybody around the table. So they are not just a part of, they are the key. And how can you monitor that, Beth? Just, you know, you, your people are not under one corporate roof. They're all around the state, all around the city. How do you engage them or, or teach them, train them? And I know you can't train them to smile, but how do you communicate with them to, to carry your brand? We have over 40 different ways uh, in any particular year that a, that a consultant can connect back with our company. Um, we consult all over the city of Nashville, so the consultants 99% of the time are out with the client. Mm -hmm. And so we look uh, for ways to get them connected back to um, keep that alignment in terms of the, the brand message, our vision, what we're trying to accomplish. And we do that in a variety of ways from um, team connections monthly that we get together and do experience sharing to uh, getting involved in the community. This fall will be part of the Dragon Boat races as an example, a way to pull people together to have that connection and that bond. For us, a key is that you have got to focus on your leaders in your organization. You've got to give them the messages, the tools, the information, the accomplishments that you've made and let that information cascade through the organization. So we think that it's important to focus on leaders if you want to reach all your employees. And we know employees want to hear from the people they report to and they want to know what does this have to do with the work that I'm doing. Today. You have to understand the culture first. I mean, no, no matter how talented employees that you're recruiting will be, if, if the employees that don't fit in the culture of your company, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and in our company, what like, we do first is we, 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 look at the, we look at our culture, it's well, well said, but then we look at the personality of the individuals. And sometimes we go like, he has all the credentials, or she has all the credentials, but really it's not going to fit. You know? So we, we, we try to maintain that culture, just leave it. Uh, very dynamic, and uh, so that's one thing that sometimes even consultants they come in, they make recommendation, but really they don't drill into the culture of the company first. And I think well, it, I think it's important uh, that the interview process and sort of vetting those employees is really important. But then, kind of once they've entered your company, uh, part of what we do, we have a fairly formalized orientation process, and the real goal of that process is to introduce them to our culture. So. Because I think employees come into a company and they see what's on the mission statement, they hear a little bit, but they really start looking around to see if what is the culture of this place, how do they want me to act, do I fit in with this culture, because you may or may not get that through an initial interview, but initially introducing them to the culture and being certain from day one that they, and our orientation process actually includes leadership, where we communicate that culture of honesty, integrity, uh, respect, and we, and we really think that if an employee, you know, our, our communication with them is primarily around initially how we expect to treat them. Because we really think that if an employee is, feels that they're treated with integrity and honesty and respect and trust, that we trust them, then they'll deliver that when they go to the doorstep, a home or a, a business, uh, then they will deliver that same approach to our customers that we, we've kind of delivered to them. So it's not so much about how you need to treat the customer, it's how we intend to treat you. And that fosters in them a desire to do the same for, for the customer. Leadership, as you so well said, um, is the key. And it's about, leadership is about uh, casting a vision. It's about uh, uh, affirming, catching people doing something good and praising it. It's about pushing credit down. It's about empowering. And then it's about feedback when they get off base, mm -hmm. but that's not a punishment thing, that's a celebratory thing. It's the same kind of thing as our kids. What do we do when they're learning to walk? We, we create boundaries and then celebrate every time they fail. We're clapping and praising and attaboying every time they fail and they learn to walk. Well, leadership's the same kind of thing and pushing credit down. Louise, you've got I don't know how many employees at CCA, but they're not all under one roof. Corrections Corporation of America uh, owns and operates 65 prisons, jails, and detention centers for government. Um, similar to CHS, we face those sort of opportunities of having a very diverse workforce um, in multiple locations. What we have recognized, as so many businesses have today, is that you need to meet your employees and communicate to them where they are. What we have really been focusing on is going from one-way communication where we're delivering news to three-way communication where we're creating a community that lets employees communicate with one another. And social media and the digital age is perfect for that. You know, a lot of businesses are very nervous about social media, so I'm glad you talked about that. And I'm interested from any of you or all of you, what kind of restrictions you put on social media or do you just let it fly? We do have a formal social media policy. It started out as a casual guideline and then once you get your lawyers uh, <laughs> and your HR team involved, it becomes very rigid as it needs to be. Um, and the goal is to encourage employees to be your ambassador, but also have them know some of the restrictions on what's confidential, what's inappropriate. And then um, we've had every single employee read and sign the social media policy. So they have to agree to further the brand. Basically, that's what you're saying. If it doesn't further the brand, it's outside the parameters of what they're supposed to use that for. Mm -hmm. David, I've been in your, uh, your place and was fascinated by um, just the response I got when I walked in the door. Just I, I was a stranger. I went in. Everybody was so friendly. And you're a family business, right? That's right. And a lot of what we've been talking about, I think, is, is very relevant to us, even though we're a much smaller company, only 175 employees. So we, we complain about having our employees at different job sites and things, but it's nothing like what you all are dealing with. And unlike other companies that can decide, you know, what are our values and what do we want to be about, our company is 72 years old, 
we already had a culture. We already had values. So we were able to bring a group of people people together and talk about, well, what are our values? You know, what are they? And, and people kind of wrote down their different ideas. And the interesting thing was when we got them all together, yep, th these are them. I mean, everybody <laughs> kind of agreed. And I think they probably came from my grandfather. But, but that's so important as a foundation. It's what you said, Bill. It's how we treat each other is really a good part of it. It's not just how the employer treats the employee. It's how employee treats employee. And, and from there, it's how they treat our customers. And so uh, it, it's back to the ego thing we were talking about earlier. You know, it it's, turns out it's not about me. It's about them, you know. And that's true if everybody is that way. And of course, when we screen uh, candidates and we talk to people, that's very important. We want healthy self-worth, that kind of thing. But if it's all about them, that's probably not going to fit in our culture. John, you were getting ready to say something. Yeah, I think there's a generational element to this as well that's really important. You know, we deal with primarily 18 to 22 year olds, and frankly, they just see the world differently and they see the workplace very differently. And so if we think about um, generating loyalty and having customers that will expand and advance your brand, uh, the millennium generation specifically, thinking about how to engage them to do that is very different. Uh, because uh, you have a generation of people that uh, are more loyal to manager than they are a company. Uh, th when they leave a company, the research shows that what they're really leaving is a manager. They're not mm -hmm. necessarily leaving as a company. Mm -hmm. And the research also shows that as they embrace values, they embrace the values of a manager and not necessarily the company. And so thinking from a leadership standpoint about how to equip managers to deal with the incoming generation into the workforce, uh, it requires a completely different skill set because um, the millennium generation specifically is just driven in a different way. You know, uh, several of you have talked about uh, not tests but kind of interview situations. Do any of you have any advice to those who are listening or watching us about any particular kind of test you find helpful or any 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 range of questions? Beth, you might you might have some ideas. One of the things that we have added to the front end is what we call a writing exercise. And it's not really a writing exercise, it's to get them uh, to, to demonstrate how they think, how they organize, how they communicate. And so we'll give them a sample problem. Um, and you could really do this, I think, with any position in any company, but a sample consulting problem or engagement or situation. And their job is to then uh, list the 20, you know, 10 or 20 questions they would ask the client and then flow chart that process. And that gives us a way to really see how they think, how they communicate, and we have found that to be very, very helpful. One small thing I might add that most people probably do, but we didn't do well for a long time is really just the way we interview with teams as opposed to very, mm -hmm. uh, having one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews. We have really expanded that yeah. throughout most of our company. So we kind of intentionally think about who's going to be on that team who are the best people to interview that person and then have the collective wisdom of those five people. We do the same thing, but we take it all the way down to uh, to uh, our even our employees. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we bring them on and they said, listen, we're going to be bringing a, a new supervisor. We want to feel how you guys feel about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's the feedback is, is, is being sure that you include everything, everything is inclusive. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, of those employees are going to be reporting to this person, mm -hmm. which you were saying before, uh, John, is that uh, you, know, you, you don't want to get just the attitude of the manager, you want to get the attitude of the company. So I've had the privilege of. Uh, uh, taking a tour with Nelson of his facility and meeting uh, just a, a whole handful of his employees and I was fascinated uh, with how interested Nelson was in their personal lives but it was fascinating the personal connection yeah. that Nelson had and I think that's a big part of this as well. So th this is how we, we work uh, we don't have and we have an open door policy as well everybody comes in we talk we share we celebrate and, uh, and when there's the rewarding uh, I don't believe in a schedule rewarding. If, if you set goals when you're going to reward your employees, then your employees are going to excel a few days before the rewarding time. <laughs> you know? Symbolic things are, are very helpful when you're in the CEO role or other leadership roles. And This was when I was running Sonic and um, the lady who headed up our, our committee of, that represented the employees came to me and 
ask me far enough out that you'd say yes to anything. And she said, uh, would you let us draw names and let the top five pe uh, officers change jobs for a day with us? And I was drawn uh, by divine providence or luck as the receptionist switchboard person. It was the longest day of my life. <laughs> I, there's a rhythm to it. I finally got into it about the last hour of the day. I will interview this young lady. Uh, she's our director of first impressions. But it, the interview was uh, we needed a receptionist to help us out to do also some admin. And when she interviewed, she said, uh, I'm interviewing for your position of Director of First Impressions. And it, it, it is amazing how the welcoming of a person gives you the culture right in the spot of the company. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that that's so key. We, um, we did a significant merger of another hospital company into our hospital company about five years ago. And when we did, we started an initiative we called Community Cares. And the goal of that program is to create hospitals where physicians prefer to practice, where employees choose to work, and where patients want to receive care. And there isn't a day that goes by that you don't hear somebody say that mantra and you don't read it somewhere in a communication and so for five years we've gone back and said this over and over again and we've trained people on behaviors that lead to those results and it does not matter if you're saving a life in an emergency room or mopping a hallway in a hospital or analyzing data in the corporate office that's what we're all here to do every single day and when you can tie to a purpose and make people feel that they are part of something larger of a, of a value and a goal that they can believe in, it transforms the workplace. That whole concept of purpose is so important and uh, it, it, it defines what your culture is and you need to not just be able to say it, but people need to feel it. I mean, it has to be real. It has to be, somebody said earlier that a person was a good leader because, he said, because you were transparent. It's because you're genuine. Uh, and and I, th I think that is such a key part of it. You know, we, we came up with the same process I described for the values that our culture is to create a culture of excellence that helps our people reach their potential and has a positive impact on everyone they touch. When we talk about that to people, that, that when, they, when they're working there, they know because everyone there is trying to help them get better. And even when we have people that leave us, are they better off for the time they spent with us? And, and most people would say yes. And that, to me, is success. I mean, I don't want people leaving, right? But sometimes there's another place they could go that's better for them and their family. And I understand that. But if they grew and were better off for that time, I feel like we've, that's our purpose of our company. So we've achieved that. We've actually, um, we're trying to develop a culture that says we have a purpose even beyond Lee Company, we're, we're toying with an idea of uh, giving people paid time off to work in 501c3s of their choice and then they have a contest where they film a little YouTube of their work, this, this group of employees that might go to this particular organization and then they submit all of those and the winning, the winning submission will get maybe a $10,000 or $15,000 or $20,000 gift to their particular charity and, and engaging our people in a culture of giving or a culture of serving that even goes beyond Lee Company. Um, because this new generation, they are about more than what our father's generation was about with regard to what they do at work. Oswald Chambers says in a spiritual way, but, but it applies to life, uh, the enemy of being our utmost for his highest isn't evil. We say no to that pretty well. It's how to say no to good. If you say yes to all good things, then you become impotent to be effective at anything. And so, you know, when I got a call from South Africa saying we want to buy the territorial rights for Sonic for this country, I could immediately say, no, we don't, want, we don't know how to do that. Or when I got a call about, I mean, from well-qualified prospective franchisees, that, uh, can I put kiosks in ballparks? Was, you know, we just don't know how to do that. We're going to stick to doing the things we know how to do. So mission statements, in addition to being something that employees can rally around and feel a key part of, it also allows you to say no to good things. We're we have talked about what some people would consider sort of soft kinds of things, but 
Am I right in, in remembering that in your plant, actually, you have on the wall the goals of the day? I mean, you, it's not just how you treat each other. Yes, that's important, and I agree with David. If you treat each other well, you're going to do that for your clients. But do you, do you have that? We actually measure production by the minute. You walk through a screen, and you'll see how so-and-so is doing. And they already created a culture that before they take the break, they stop, oh, I'm doing good. And if they're not doing good, it's probably equipment, it's not them, you know, or I need some help, or I don't feel good today at home, I have some issues, that's okay. Take off, and that's the other thing, you gotta be flexible. You know what, you need to go home, that's okay. Just go home and don't worry. And, and that's, that's what you gotta create. Well, I just and wanna make sure that we cover that, that you know, we're, we're not just talking about how everybody feels, we are talking about being productive and being efficient. And, and so I just think that's a great example of how you, that's part of your brand. I mean, your, your brand is your most efficient company you could hire. And that's because you have instilled that in your employees, they have pride in it, and they're rewarded for it. I wanna piggyback off of that, that, that what we do, or what we've learned is it, it, we have to measure production and give that information back to the people that are making it happen. Not not because we're sitting in the office with cigars seeing how <laughs> productive we are. That's that's not relevant. I mean, that, that doesn't work. But if you show them a graph that says, you know, here is what we have to work with, uh, you know, here's how much you've used and here's how much you've earned based on production, like, you don't have to explain that. You just post it. They get it. You know, it's a picture. Uh, and th that by giving them that every week, we, week's about as short as we've gotten right now, but then they know, we don't even have to, we can ask some questions, but the truth is they know that that's, if it's not good, they know that's not good and they need to do something different. And they're in the best position to figure out what to do differently. They're also the best in the best position to tell you what that information should be for the most part. What, what we've done is said, you give us what you think you're, key performance indicators are, your KPIs, and then we will post those. And they generally come up with what they know, how they know they ought to be performing, and we, we post them internally in the, in, the, in the office. We post them by group all over the building, and they're in the hallways for people to see, and they're all graphical, and they're little, uh, uh, little dashboards. And so every month you can walk around and look at everybody's dashboards. A couple of things that we track and really monitor that tie to our culture. One is how much money are we spending on training? Mm -hmm. uh, training is typically the first budget line item to be cut in a major corporation. And we see that as a real opportunity to grow and differentiate ourselves. And then the second one is how much are we giving back to the community? Not just how much are we financially giving back to the organizations, but how many leaders do we have on boards and communities and how much are we doing in terms of uh, community service and then uh, pro bono work that we do with some nonprofits. An important point that I think all of you have touched on is the whole idea of having employees engaged in setting the goals and even establishing the values for the company. And I'm reminded of uh, a story that Coach K told when he was over at Lipscomb speaking last year about when you know, he took over the Olympic team. And he says, here I am, you know, a college coach, but in my locker room is LeBron and Kobe. And he says, you know, I couldn't give them a curfew. He says, no way in the world I could give them a curfew. And so he says, in that moment I recognize that um, I wasn't going to be able to be authoritarian, and so it required a different kind of leadership. And so he talked about how he turned to Kobe and said, all right, Kobe, uh, you know, we've got to come up with standards for this team. Why don't you throw one out there? And Kobe says, well, uh, no one be late. Uh, with the bus leaves at 7.30, we're all on the bus at 7.30. Coach, anyone have a problem with that? I said, no. I said, all right, that's Kobe's rule. So now if they broke the rule, it was Kobe's rule, it wasn't my rule. And then at the end, what I thought was so powerful was when Coach K then had them all give him the authority to enforce their rules. And to then take that and apply it in business in terms of saying, mm -hmm. let's all together come up with what our goals and what our values and what's that going to be, but then you all give me uh, the authority to then lead you in terms of accomplishing uh, objectives that we all own and we've all been a part of creating. At Sonic we did this button one year that was a square and it said yes in the middle and then it had values around it. The point was the answer is yes, what's the question? And uh, the point we were making with our employees was if you happen to make a mistake with a, with 
one of your customers, if that's not solved on the spot, by the time they get to me with the complaint, they're a terrorist. They, they are out to do us damage, and they do severe damage. But when you go to a, a restaurant and have a bad experience, you tell on the average 22 people. When you, when you have a good experience, you tell four people. And you don't go to restaurants where your friends tell you they had a bad experience. So it, it costs us very little for you to solve it on the spot. You are empowered to do that. If it's give the next meal on us, uh, here's a, a, a card that allows you to do that. That's so important. I'm always impressed when I can tell an employee is empowered to fix my problem. It's very impressive. Tommy, I'm going to ask you the most, maybe the most difficult question. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about branding and what our companies are, but with all companies, mistakes are made. Things happen, right? Nobody here has a perfect company where every day everything goes right. How important is it to explain to so many employees when something happens and it's not consistent with your brand. I think you've just got to be honest and you've got to, you know, when you have something go wrong in an organization, you have to, to help people understand why it went wrong and what you're doing to stop it from happening again. And if you have an organization that has the right culture and that has the right values, you learn from mistakes mm -hmm. and you build upon those and you become stronger and you become better because of those things. You never want them to happen but you, you, you can't shy away from it when they do. You have to deal with them head on. As long as you depersonalize it, I think it's helpful because it's not about that one person or that team that made the mistake, but it's about learning. In, in, in our company, we depersonalize it from the employee standpoint, but we try to personalize it from the customer standpoint. Yes. We, and we, we communicate regularly to our folks that every time we get a complaint, statistically there are 19 other people who haven't complained but who have had the same bad experience so we do try to kind of make sure they recognize we didn't just have five complaints today mrs jones was unhappy with the yep. way we did this and she's a she's an important person and she matters to us and there's 20 others and uh you know approach that's that very powerful yeah, i think what the the employee can hear it from us but it doesn't mean as much as when they hear this specific example from the client. There are two kinds of mistakes. We're talking about the ones that are within the boundaries of our culture, our cultural boundaries. But there are mistakes that occur that are outside of the, the, the cultural boundaries. And I think you have to deal with those violently, quickly, and differently. Yeah, you can't just talk it, you got to walk it, you got to walk the culture. We're, I know we're coming to the end of our time, believe it or not, because it's been such fabulous information. I've been taking notes to take back to the office. Um, but is there anything on anyone's mind in, in terms of, uh, that we haven't talked about today, in terms of branding and something that you can bring to the table that worked for you? If we hire somebody that doesn't fit, a good person, but they just don't fit, how do, we, how do you all deal with that? I think you hire slowly and you fire quickly, and I don't remember the exact quote to that, but I think it's true. You, um, a, a person that's, that does not fit in the culture should stick out like a sore thumb, or you have a fractured culture. So it's obvious, and the right thing to do for the company and for the individual is to find opportunities for that person. So that's sort of my, my short Answer. As in other opportunities? As other opportunity outside of the company. Yes. <laughs> Difficult things to do. Difficult. When it becomes apparent they're not going to be successful inside your company, yeah. you're doing them a favor you to really help them go someplace else. Hard to do. And, and Hard to do. Is, yeah, especially as your culture changes. If you're, our company is 70 years old. We have 40 year employees. Things are really different today than they were 30 years ago. Our culture is different. Our expectations are different. But you're sitting there with a 36 year employee who's 58 years old and not fitting and uh, that you know uh, just to throw out there it's tough it's, 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 it's tough. tough I want to thank everybody this has been a wonderful roundtable and I think we all learned something got to share something thank you all very very much